Hello and welcome to Garden Chatter, where we connect gardeners, bloggers, and experts so that we can all grow and learn together. I'm super excited. Tonight we have Matt Powers on. Matt's going to be talking to us about permaculture. He's been doing a lot uh, with permaculture and learning and putting it into practice on his place. Um, we had all, almost had him on the show a couple weeks ago, but we had a technical issue, and he was gracious enough to, uh, to rejoin us. So we'll get to him in just a moment. The great thing about um, Google Hangouts Fun Air is that you can join the conversation and leave questions or comments that we can respond to. And so my co-host, Bren, can tell how you can join the, join the show. Bren, how are you doing over in Ohio? <laughs> well, we're getting plenty of April showers here in Ohio, and so I'm going to be excited to see what May flowers they bring, right? So um, anyhow, so if you are watching this presentation you, on the uh, Google Hangout, you're going to want to take your cursor, just go right up to the top right, there'll be a grid. Click on the grid and you'll see a Q&A, hit the Q&A, and you'll get a nice little bar over there. I always get it mixed up, it's that way, right? <laughs> On the uh, right-hand side of your screen, where we hope you will say hi and hopefully ask some questions for our awesome guest host tonight. Um, and, oh, I also want to note that you can also use the hashtag Garden Chatter. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, and Matt, how are you doing over there? It looks like you're in the sun right now. Yeah, you know, these California foothill storms, they kind of roll in and roll out pretty quick. Um, we, uh, we don't tend to get uh, much prolonged moisture when we get it. Um, and then our soil is often pretty hydrophobic. And so um, it'll, just, it'll just pearl off and kind of run off and then create more erosion. So that, that, I mean, when most people can kind of see that in the valley in different areas that it deserves fine. So um, it's kind of, it, 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 on my area, though, it's actually wonderful because all the water gets trapped. And so if you, let me, can you, you guys can all see me, right? So if I go like this and you kind of look at and see what I'm looking at right now, all my plants, and then down this hill over the edge, <laughs> is all swaled. So, you can still see it, right? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Do you see all the, the stuff down there? I see. No? I think I can see the swales. There's a little bit of uh, glare with the sunlight. Is that better? I think uh, those are the swales there, right? The little... Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we've all seen the terraces... Uh, that the Mayans did, and, and you know, in China for the rice patties and all that stuff, and we've all seen that over and over again, but no one's doing it really. And the reason they did it was because it allowed them to save their soil, because it allowed them to fully capture pass and pacify water. So, in California especially, it um, it's a way to start. Uh, reforesting the land and that's really like the issue all right so uh, there's been a, a recent paper that's uh, been done I can't remember stop it <laughs> all right so um, there's been a recently a paper that was done about how um, if the forest is cut on the coast it doesn't have moisture conveyor belt into the, in, in, the, in, the inland where the forests are so if we don't have this, this, and you know the way the way it works is trees interact with wa uh, the water from the ocean that comes in, and then they tra evapotranspire water. Um, but they also trap so much water in the ground and create so much shade, uh, and they create all these other relationships around them that they actually create rain. So if we don't have this layered effect of having forests bringing in moisture. Um, and and the the earthworks in place, the Central Valley is going to be um, in real trouble really fast. But we can still turn it around. I mean, the reality is things are not as crazy as people are making it out to be. Headlines are wonderful things um, because they're so fun, uh, and they get us scared and excited and, and angry. And but um, they're really mostly meaningless. So the whole one year of water left in California is you know spurious at best. 
So yes, I'm so kind of like just, interrupt just for a second. So you said in the Central Valley. So for folks that don't know exactly where you are, um, so you're in California. Where where in California are you? Okay, so uh, if you think Fresno's here and Yosemite's here, the road between them is Highway 41, and we're like right here. And so it's we're you know Fresno, uh, the air is really bad. And uh, in Yosemite, um, it's so beautiful. And uh, we're kind of a mix between desertification and beautiful landscape. And so it's really about, like, bringing out the aspects of, of, of what's already here um, for me right now. But, yeah, that's where I am. I'm in the Central Valley. <laughs> okay. I'm where the, I'm where the fires were. So, like, uh, Mariposa is an hour and a half that way. And then uh, Oakhurst is that way. And those were where those uh, two big fires were um, last year. And then um, uh, North Fork's that way where there was another really big fire um, recently, too. And they still all made national news. Uh, and those were, like, the fires that people talked about up here. Uh, and so we're, fire is a very big deal. We want to kind of create fire belts to, like, protect uh, the land, um, but you, you can't prove those kind of things until you have a fire, which is, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little bit of a tricky part, huh? Yeah. So, so you have been um, really diving into permaculture. Do you want to just explain maybe for someone that doesn't really know what permaculture is? Like, what, what okay, is Okay, I'll give a definition and then explain why I came to it. Because okay. I feel like there's some people out there who are doing organic, and they're like, I still don't get it. I'm supposed to be, this is supposed to work, right? There's a lot of people out there that feel that way. And for me, as soon as I learned permaculture, it was like, I got this. And it was unreal. And still to this day, I haven't found anyone with better soil than me. So, and, and, and my soil like that I developed that's the best has only been, um, I mean, it's only like seven months old. All right, so permaculture is, um, is a design, an ethical design science that benefits both people and the environment beneficially, you know, it benefits both people and the environment. <laughs> so it's, it, you basically take the patterns of nature and the systems of nature and you figure out how to use them to run a farm or a business or an economy or a school, like it can be applied to anything, but originally it was permanent agriculture. Um, and a lot of people say it's permanent culture now. Um, because it can be applied to so many things. But what's really, really fantastic about it is it solved for me a lot of problems. Um, I wasn't, I, I didn't realize I was just mining the soil and I wasn't building the soil. And so there's this like threshold and you kind of, you're like, oh, I'm doing, I'm, I'm companion planting, I'm adding my compost, I'm, you know, you're doing all these things, but it's just not, it's just not working. So, um, especially in places where it's getting really dry, and probably places where it's getting really wet, because unless you have earthworks when it's really wet, um, you're dealing with a lot of water. But if you have earthworks, you have a place for that water. Um, by earthworks, I mean like those swales. Uh, you can do a whole diverse, different, you know, lots of different versions of those kind of things. You don't even really need swales. You could rip your land along contour. That means like uh, like a plow that's just a cut. And then you could like um, water compost tea down there and then plant trees in it. And you could create a totally um, amazing effect. So there's there's actually a lot of different ways because every climate has like give points. Like for instance, in the tropics, you cannot have acres of corn. It just doesn't work. So, like, the jungle and the tropics and their ecosystems support these, like, small, these small open spaces. And everything else is very chunky and very large. But in the cold temperate climate world, you know, corn and all these kind of things, like, really reused recently, grains, right? Um, those areas actually can support quite big fields despite, you know, meadows, right? Those naturally occur, right? So 
So stuff like that, you know, permaculture is all about um, the, the language of nature, and it basically takes ecology, and instead of it being an observation, uh, like an observational science, it's an action-based science based upon um, nature. So you, so you figure out the patterns, you observe the patterns of nature, and then you harmonize with them. So in other words, I'm looking at this hill, I'm measuring how it's gone contour, and then I'm planting on contour, or I'm making a ditch on contour and making a soft berm on the lower side called swale, and planting in that, and that's harmonic to nature because what's going to happen is going to create a flat path and it's going to stop all the water. And it's going to create harmony, right? Right. So, um, Matt, first of all, I, I have to tell you, I think it's neat that your your pooch is there with you, your puppy. <laughs> we usually have cat people on. <laughs> so oh, it's, well, it's nice to see a dog. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, That's awesome. <laughs> let, yeah, let me explain how I came to gardening because that, like, might put it more uh, – in, in, because I, I'm not – I didn't start off gardening – in the traditional sense, I came out west, and I was a professional musician, mm -hmm. and they had this garden, and we were buying organic food because my wife had a, had cancer, um, had had cancer because they removed her thyroid and then did ablation, you know, radiation therapy, um, and so this garden they had it was huge. They built this huge garden, fenced it. Um, not as teaching my system now, but and so they made this. Uh, they made this garden, and it didn't go very well, and it got overtaken with weeds. And I was like, you know, food's expensive. Yeah. Maybe I should try growing it. And um, and and I also was figuring out that like the really good food, not the organic food, because organic is just like a minimal standard. That means it doesn't have poison on it, to a certain degree, because some there's new organic standards that allow things, but it's like, so that's a minimal. That doesn't, like, guarantee that the, that it's nutritious even. You know, it could be all just water and then, like, a fertilizer, basically. So nitrogen, water, and a little bit of fiber. So in my mind, I started, like, really questioning things. And then I was like, how the heck do you tell any of these things without paying a lab huge amounts of money? So I was getting, like, super frustrated. Um, and then I discovered... Permies.com and Sepp Holzer and Jeff Lawton and the term permaculture. And basically, very quickly, like Sepp Holzer's method is he doesn't do transplants. He doesn't do greenhouses where he's growing his annuals to put them in. He throws everything or plants it in the ground by hand. He has 30,000 trees on 100 acres. He manages the land with animals. So, like, he goes in and picks the apples or, or whatever for, for, the, for the sale for this company. He sometimes sells uh, to schnapps companies and stuff uh, because this stuff is so um, high quality. They can't get it at the lower altitudes. Um, and so he'll bring in the pigs, and the pigs will eat all the deadfall fruit and the fruit that's infected with parasites, and so it'll interrupt the pest cycle, and it will feed his pigs, and they'll eat the weeds and trot them down and manure it and everything, and then he just moves them through, and then he's got his orchard reset, you know. And it's like those kind of, like, having, and then he'll use pigs to um, create, create ponds, He'll have them, you know, he'll, they'll, they'll, he'll fence, or fence them, or I don't know if he'll even fence them. I think pigs actually will naturally go to a good pond site because of the way it works um, moisture-wise. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I was just wondering, like, so what you um, mentioned that, you know, beyond just the compost and the, and this and that, what are some of the other things that are working for you to build your soil? So you've done the swales. I don't right. Know. So let, yeah, let me just share what I do. Okay. Yeah. So what's, uh, what's um, working for you? What I did is I cut on contour. I flipped over the sod. I did it upside down, and then um, I chopped it up um, so that it would be loose. And then um, 
I don't even think I added any bunny manure. Bunny manure is really fun because it's already um, neutral. It's not gonna like burn anything. Like like uh, uh, not neutral. Um, the nitrogen is not too hot. It's balanced, right. and so you can just toss it in. Um, but I don't think you know, I even did that. What I did there was I tossed like ten pounds of cow peas on it because I saw Jeff Lawton do that. And I was like, ah, I can't do this everywhere. I can't afford to do it everywhere, you know. So I was like, oh, I'll do what he says to exactly here, you know. And I'm like wincing as I'm doing it because it feels like too much. Because you like can like feel the dollar like that <laughs> you just like that spot this big and you're like, all right. You know, but what happened was it all started fixing nitrogen in the soil like, you know, just started changing and I mixed in the Fukuoka mix, you know, which is all, you know, you throw everything, and that's how I planted, uh, and that's how I plant a lot of things, I just throw. So, um, I did daikon radish, because that creates huge holes in the soil, goes really deep, and rots, um, and I planted mustard um, to a small degree, and clover, inoculated cl clover, uh, which has taken off to a certain degree. Um, yeah, and so the cow peas, what they did when they broke down was obviously they turned into, you know, pea straw, uh, which is also nitrogen fixing. But it, I, I, I chopped and dropped it, and so it, it rotted and, like, broke down on itself. And it you literally can dig three to four feet deep. And it's all the same color and like the most unbelievable texture. It's incredible. Like, how, how deep do the uh, cow peas go? Because you said that the daikon radishes go deep. Do the, do the cow peas punch down pretty well, too? Um, I. You know, if they do, their roots break down so fast. I don't think so. Um, I mean, the legumes are just like light-footed weeds. That's why a lot of them end up on the noxious, like, or the invasive weeds list, you know. And those are those are really all those ones that are really bad, and, uh, you know, like sharp and spiny. Those are the ones that we have on our worst soil. So if we want to get rid of those, you actually can just run a chicken tractor over them, and they'll. Dig everything up, scratch everything, and if you keep like them on that patch a little bit, you can even toss a little grain in there, and they'll just like dig more, um, and then move them. Um, you and leave it alone. You'll have like totally different things growing. Hmm. Like you just leave it, and like the weeds recolonize it. You have totally different things growing, and it's part of the secession of the forest. So you change the pH. So, of course, different weed seeds are going to grow. The pH is different. You know, the nitrogen is different. The, you know, the calcium is different. So, there's all these different layers that lead to secession. So, let me talk about secession for a second. So, the secession of a forest. So, if we go to the beach, it starts off as dead sand, right? And then we're going, and it's like sea kale. You have mustard. You have, um, like, turnips and radishes. Um, and then you have like cauliflower, brassicas, the actinobacterial you know, soil has a place in nature, right? So they came from a place in nature. And then you go further and then you have bacterial soils, which is like many of the garden varieties that we eat are annuals that are like, um, that are uh, in the bacterial and uh, slightly acidic, slightly alkaline, that range there. But when you start going more fungal, you go into old growth forest, which is actually much more stable and traps water. So the reality is the Central Valley needs to stop doing annuals, cutting their soil every year. What they need to do is focus on perennials and trees. And yeah, it's a long-term investment, but we need to stop looking at things like this to start looking at things in a wider view because we're going, the profits of the farmer, ah, and everyone else is going, wait a second, what about water? And we're looking at like maybe like this and not this, even there. And what we need to do is we need to actually 
look ahead and imagine what we want and then decide how to get there. But no one is actually looking at what a stable ecosystem in the Central Valley would look like. The west side is a desert with no water, so we should do a big desert guild and hope that we can connect the coastal forest to the mountain forest and get the, get the water to start again. Because the largest body of water west of the Mississippi was in the Central Valley up until like either late 1800s or the early 1900s. I'm, well, I want to say the early 1900s, but I'm not going to say for sure because I don't really know in my head right now. But he, King, uh, King Cotton drained that, and basically they set up all irrigations, and they made, <laughs> there's basically cities that would be under, under three feet, four feet of water um, that, that, that would, you know, wouldn't even be there because this body of water would still be there. And it was all duck and fish. There were no predators. So you could go out in a boat with your kid and just go hunt for the weekend and have it be like this, you know, like easy peasy kind of experience that was like Disneyland of hunting. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it was once wonderful. We can recreate that because the land was designed for that. Um, it, you know what I mean? Like the land, is, it was ready. It did it. It was great. We can, re we can rebuild that, and we actually probably can enhance it a little bit as we put it back together. Um, you had uh, mentioned you had chickens. I was just wondering if um, I thought maybe you had a pig. Are, how are you using uh, animals to, to uh, build the soil, and are you kind of putting them to use? Yeah. My animals are my workers. Sepp Holzer um, is an amazing guy. He, he totally um, inspired me and really uh, drilled that in that if you don't if you don't want to do the uh, if you don't want animals to do the work for you then you have to do the work the animals do and often that work is incredibly complex um, and we actually don't even really understand it so let's take uh, like birds like my birds up there I bring in uh, animal bedding that's used I bring in manure I bring in um, uh, weeds from the yard, um, though I don't even think of them as weeds in a negative way. They're just really mulch, and they're just different types of plants. Once you learn the plant's names, you're like, oh, and that's a type of amaranth. It's called pigweed. You know, like, that means amaranth grows wild here. It'll grow really well here. You know, you just, once you get past that. So I feed my chickens all this different stuff. I actually, a local grocery store gives us their uh, old produce for them. And so what I do is I mix it all together. Um, and I turn it just like a compost. So I rebuild a hill for them, and they're constantly breaking it down and digging it out. And they're actually creating this incredible, like, compost mulch stuff. And it, it gets hot. It does the whole composting thing. They stop where the heat is, and then they just, like, enjoy the heat. Mm. And so they don't dig too far into the heat because it's hot. And so they just, like, you know what I mean? They clear off all the stuff that's not decomposing, exposed to decomposing, so that I'm like, okay, it's hot. I'm going to break that up and aerate it and mix it everything they, they removed. And so you relayer it, right? Um, and then it breaks down more and more, and eventually I can't do anything with the pitchfork because it passes through. I'm like, okay, now I have two choices. I can go take it away and traditionally compost it for another week and get really, really nice compost. Or I could put it on my weeds that I just chopped and dropped, burn them because it's still a little hot, and then as it cools off, because I didn't do it in like that thick, I did it like that thick, as it cools off the next week or two, I can start planting in it. So, you know what I mean? And so like those weeds that were there are now smothered with mulch, mulch like compost, and they, um, they've been kind of like burned out after they've been chopped and dropped. So I can go in there a week two or two later and like chop up the soil and then like throw my beans or my corn or my amaranth or my Aztec spinach or whatever I really want that's larger seed um, and not uh, well and it also depends on the vigor of the seed because uh, you can throw mustard in which is fine um, and then I go back through and sometimes I push things in sometimes I push things over onto things but often I just scatter mulch over that and, and then get it wet you can also soak the beans and do that too to speed things up um, 
But so the chickens are like my partners in mulch making, and that's why I don't kill my roosters. Because my roosters, um, I, I have a bunch of roosters from this group that I grew out of chicks uh, that we uh, incubated that were from eggs that were laid on this farm. It's six o'clock. <laughs> Uh, my phone, uh, my, uh, anyway. Um, uh, so, my, I'm going to create a rooster yard so they can just make me mulch. And I'm just going to bring them tons of manure and tons of uh, cuttings and everything. And I'm never going to feed them any grain or anything because there's no reason to. The birds survive just fine on the bugs that are attracted to um, all the compost and all, all, all that stuff. They're um, they're actually not eating what um, grosses us out in the manure land. They're eating the stuff that um, is feeding on it, and then some of it's so microscopic and it's happening so fast that it's like really hard to prove what they are and aren't eating. Um, but it's clear that they're not like gobbling up manure. You know what I mean? And it's also clear that. Um, that I mean, Joel Salatin's system where the birds follow the um, the the, uh, the the cows and they tear up the cow patties. What happens is the soil is much much better. And so, yeah. if you're growing the soil, and if the birds are doing it naturally, and if it's you know healthy for the birds, and the, you know what I mean, if it's all these different things, functions, and stacking, then they're all healthy and they're all provable. Then. Mm -hmm. I fully believe that it's natural and healthy to do it that way. Yeah, it sounds like a good plan. I've been kind of moving towards that direction, just ripping out yeah. lots of uh, quote unquote weeds and grass. I, I haven't been weed eating really mostly around. I've just. I got a site. I, I got a site. Yeah. Yeah, so you would, just, you would just like chop it down before it forms seed heads, right? Exactly. So. Yeah, I just kind of go like 10 square feet at a time or five and just take it down to the ground, take an arm load, throw it in with the chickens, and. Uh, that's been working. So I'm, I don't quite have enough stuff in there to really start composting, but um, that's kind of the direction mm. I'm heading. So sounds good. Well, what so, about you? You're trying to grow. What's that? I was just saying about your place. What you could do is after you cut it like that and you're taking away, something else is going to come in there, and it's not going to be replaced by that secession. And often it will be replaced by a secession that you don't want. So what you want to do is you want to rake it. And then you want to toss in something desirable that's soft and nice, and also nitrogen fixing so the option later on to do something with that piece of land. So you do a nitrogen fixing inoculated um, clover seed, like a New Zealand uh, white or something like that. And that, that'll that be like a placeholder that's improving the soil. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah and it's a like green and all that. So what was the question? Oh, well, I was just wondering, uh, just kind of changing gears a little bit, you're, you've been trying to grow lots of food that will sustain your family, you know, not just broccoli and carrots and peas, but some things that will really, you know, tide you through. So what, what are you excited about um, coming up, or what are some of the things you're going to be growing this spring and summer? Okay, cool. So part of everyone's mission and wherever they're at is figuring out what the land will support at um, staples, like at staple, like, level. Um, the foothills definitely can do uh, amaranth um, grain, and it's especially good because amaranth um, doesn't require any like uh, post-treatments. It's very easy to harvest. You can do it in a bowl and blow it off, and that's that's good enough, and that'll be clean. And it makes like a porridge. So that's like a really good survival crop. I'm growing that out, and then culinarily, I want to really figure out how to make it um, uh, something that people want and desire and like, oh, you know what, I prefer that. So uh, I'm like a cook. I used to actually, before I was into permaculture, I did seasonality recipes. And I, I, my recipes are still online in places. Uh, but like I would, I would teach people how to cook food um, out of the garden according to season. And so um, amaranth was one of those things I wanted to work on. Yellow strawberries is fun. Um, stuff like that, um, different greens that people don't eat usually, like quinoa greens are actually awesome. Um, red Aztec spinach is awesome. Uh, you know, something that's very underrated is uh, strawberry spinach. Um, so, so, 
So talking about staples with my family. All right, so this area supports winter squash really well. So I've been working on adapting and creating local varieties of things because I let things mix. Um, because what I find is it's like I crossed a, a Queensland blue with um, a curry, and it made this like like volleyball size blue curry, and it's awesome. It was totally awesome. So I'm like, this is cool. You just keep doing your thing, you know. <laughs> and the reality is no one has that but me. And huh. what, I, what I, in my mind, imagine is that everyone should be doing this because that means those genes are radically adapting to your environment. And it's not like you're inbreeding, you know what I mean, flipping like these insular switches, right? You're like doing... Uh, Within the same species, uh, um, uh, you're do or um, not species, uh, same variety. You're doing kind of like a wide cross. Wide crosses can be between almost anything, so don't take that out of context. It's within its own thing. So you could do really crazy things like try to cross. But I've noticed that it's the funny thing is it's like you're not getting acorn squashes crossing with like Hubbards. So the bees are at least that much, they distinguish that much. Because you know they go in teams, right? They're like, today we're doing tomatoes. And they're like, tomatoes! And they all go and fly and do tomatoes. That's like what bees do. So, like, I think that maybe they're, like, if, and that's the other thing. If you have, like, one of every kind of squash, they're going to cross like crazy. But if you have, like, 20... Um, of like the blue Hubbard, and then you have like three sugar pie, you know, pumpkin, and then you have like forty um, black um, footsu, which is really awesome. Black footsu, gotta recommend that. Baker Creek, at rareseeds.com. I was going to ask you where some of these vegetables are coming from because I've not heard of half of them. <laughs> okay. All right. So let me let me give the lowdown. All right. So <laughs> groworganic.com is really great for perennials that are organic um, and trees. Um, but remember, we want to buy in January because by like you know February March everything sold out. So and yeah. then. Uh, uh, Baker Creek with rareseeds.com is where I, I've gotten almost all my seeds. Jerry uh, Gettle um, and his family um, totally inspired me early on, and I, I met them at the Heirloom Expo, and they actually supplied the seeds for my uh, high school through uh, Paul Wallace over at, and Eileen Wallace, um, which are a wonderful couple over. They managed the Petaluma Seed Bank, um, which is which is also owned by the Gettle family. So, um, wonderful people and wonderful seeds. And then I branched out. Territorial Seeds has some awesome stuff. Um, seed Savers Exchange is like, man, oh, man, everyone should be part of it. It's the biggest database of seeds you can find. It's way better than the Grin database. Through the school, I was able to get some seeds for the kids there to work with. And the, and the horticulture department we work with, their seeds are awful. They totally baby them with, like, <laughs> chemicals and everything. And um, so they just have weak genes. It's, and they're, like, like, taking the diversity and just weakening it. So, um, yeah. Um, and so uh, I've got all these great seeds. All right. And I'm getting them also from Bountiful Gardens because they have some things that I can't get anywhere else. Um, yeah, the Seed Savers Exchange is a basically a, a cooperative between, like, thousands of gardeners who all, like, create a database, and you can buy from that person and then, like, call them up and be like, hey, the beans you, I bought from you are doing this weird thing, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, is this, you know, have you done this to your soil? It needs to be, you know, like that. Like, oh, okay, you know. You literally can call them or write them. And so it's a totally different dynamic, and it's, there's like 10,000 varieties. So wow. it's like a telephone book of, of everything that you can't get ever else. And Baker Creek, bless them, they're doing amazing things. Now someone else that's really good is Joe Simcox over at the Botanical Explorer. 
He has the the rare seeds vegetable a rare vegetable seed consortium online, and then um, I'm missing something. Oh yeah, Carol Depp. I buy seeds directly from Carol Depp, the person who wrote Resilient Gardener and uh, the Tao of Gardening and How to Breed Your Own Vegetable Varieties. She's uh, went to Harvard. She's a, a geneticist. Uh, mm -hmm. She has a PhD. Unbelievably awesome writer. Um, I also she inspired me before permaculture, and then after like permaculture, I was like, oh, you just permaculture because you're really educated. <laughs> yeah. We had a, qu a couple of uh, questions yeah. on our yeah. comment blog from uh, Bean and Bee blog, um, Alexis over there. Um, earlier on, we were talking about the the chickens and livestock, and she said, was wondering yeah. what if you can't have livestock. And then before you dive into that, um, she also asked, have you ever grown purslane? Oh yeah, I, I, well purslane showed up. It just showed up. Yeah. Purslane yeah. showed up, and then have you saved seed from purslane? They make these tiny little cups like this, and then the, the, inside the cup, they're, they're, the, they're, the, they're like the teeniest little seeds ever. They're the, they're the most novel seed that you can have. Like forget mustard seeds. This is the tiniest seed like that I've ever harvested. It's so cute. Um, I think the first time I harvested, I couldn't believe it was a seed. I just started cracking up. Um, but yeah, yeah. Personally, I've grown and I, I've saved seed from. I have some in my seed library, um, which uh, everyone should have. They should have their own seed bank and library and whatnot, and they should have their own set of seeds that they share. Everyone should be sharing seed. So we should be having the genetics go and go and go because we've lost so much diversity. We've had this huge die-off of diversity of food that we need to bring back. Um, so and we all can participate in that. So going back to what you're talking about, you don't have animals, well, um, collect cardboard and newspapers, uh, dig up the land, throw down some manure. Um, it can be fresh. It doesn't matter as long as the cardboard's on top. And then have soaked cardboard, throw it on there. They do like pretty thick, um, not crazy thick. You want it to be able to be wet and then uh, to, to to soak and then um, to like breathe through. So don't go too crazy. I've heard up in wetter areas that they would have like this much newspaper and it would be dry underneath. So you want to be careful about that. Um, you just don't want weed seeds to pop up through it. But either way, I don't think it will. Um, so, and then you want to do whole, ideally seedless manure on top of bunny manure or something like that. So this creates this pancake with um, the woody, uh, wood lignin in, inside. And mm -hmm. so that creates like fungus, right? And then the nitrogen's on either side. And so fungus needs nitrogen to grow. That's why you do coffee grinds. Use coffee grinds in the oysters. The oyster mushroom grows, right? And so, so you're creating a fungal network that connects your entire backyard. Um, and then you can do um, like six inches of like straw or mulch or something like that, or like broken down leaves maybe. Um, uh, and then um, you can do like two to three inches of compost. Um, and then the thing is, I, I mean, I've heard horror stories about compost because some people don't understand that like compost needs to be like normal temperature, not warm, like not still breaking down. Someone was like, yeah, I've got this great compost. It's still warm. And I'm like, uh, it's not compost yet. <laughs> you know, it's composting. So um, you put that compost on, and then you scatter mulch on top. And that will break down into soil, and you, while you, and you can grow in it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and by grow in it, I mean that you would cut down through it down to the soil and grow directly on the soil. You know what I mean? Um, and you would likely be transplanting into the system unless you're tearing and getting soil and planting in that like a pumpkin seed or something. Uh, and like if you want to do set holzer's mode, you're going to like build soil like they do in the tropics because they don't do compost or anything down there because the bugs will like eat it up and take it away. It goes... I mean, compost, you, as soon as it breaks down, it's gone in, in the tropics. So what, what they do down there, like Rosemary Morrow was talking to me about this one time. She said that um, you have to do green mulch. You have to do green manure. Um, you have to grow your soil and then cut it and then grow it and then cut it. And so it creates this building 
of of layers, just like it in the peat moss, you know, they grow and then die, grow and then die, grow and then die, grow and then die. And so you have this layered effect in the peat moss that we're all using up at a rapid rate. Though I don't use any of that kind of stuff. Um, I go down the, the side of the hill all the way to the dry creek and I dig up uh, from the inside bends of, of turns in the creek. I dig up sharp river sand, bring it up and mix it with um, good dirt so that it's 50-50 ratio and plant my seed, seed, my transplant seeds in that. Because what happens is it makes them squirm because the water goes so fast through. So they're like, ah, ah, and they follow the water. And so they sprout faster, the roots develop faster, and you can transplant them faster. Ah. <clears throat> so um, that's what I would do if I had no other options for a backyard. Or I would borrow some animals for a few um, weeks and just hope no one catches you. Um, <laughs> Pigs are great at like deeper tilling, um, so like you plant potatoes after pigs are there. Uh, you can get light tiller like American guinea hog or tiny, uh, but even they get pretty, pretty close to like you know fingerling potato depth. So huh. if you can move them fast enough, they'll just eat, eat the grass. And American guinea hogs will prefer to eat weeds over your food. I've seen it over and over again. My pig used to go with me when it was young to the garden and stuff before it got too aggressive and dug down and ate potatoes. Then it stopped coming with me. <laughs> so, um, so Matt, say, um, say somebody's new to permaculture and they yeah. live in a small, they live in a small space, um, you know, where you, you may be able to have some backyard chickens and you probably have a dog running around maybe. Do you have any tips that, that could be used to incorporate this into their lifestyle? Totally. Maybe even let's take it smaller. Let's go even more challenging. Let's go urban. So that's the one that everyone's afraid of. They're like, well, I want to be green. I want to do permaculture, but I'm in an apartment building. So um, there are things that grow with like hardly any light. There are actual citrus trees that grow in apartments. They're low-light citrus. So they never need to come outside. So there are things for this. And then... If you have a balcony, turn that into a greenhouse or a cold frame. And then you pot everything, and what you do is you basically, after you do a run of something, you dump the soil out, and then you have to, like, reboot your soil. There's a bunch of different ways you can reboot your soil. Um, I mean, you could, you probably could create a trough and, like, never till it. I would have to experiment with it because what you could do is you could grow beans in with it and then you could cut it and make the soil and you could chop and drop it. But you would want to do a perennial thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like we don't cut this. We cut the soil for annuals. Um, we don't till the soil. We would want to just make it so we get them in, right? Mm -hmm. um, or you toss them and then cover them. Annuals too. That works. Um, but like you never cut a perennial. Um, so... You would, I and mean, you can amend sort of, I guess. But um, like a kiwi is a uh, kiwi is perfect. So let's say um, you have a kiwi male, put it in a smaller pot because you just need the flowers for it. You do a kiwi female, um, and you have the kiwi female. You can have grow into the house if you want fuzzy, um, in, like around the windows and stuff. Um, but if you're in a colder time, let's say New York, New York City, you could do hardy kiwi and start growing it up. Talk to all your neighbors and be like, here, here's a, a basket of them. I'm growing them. And they all eat them and be like, this is wonderful. I want this. And be like, okay, let it grow onto your balcony. Because next year it's there. <laughs> and for real, next year it will be there. It goes 40 to 60 feet into the air, okay? So <laughs> it will be there. So, so, and, then you, and then what you do next year is you're like, all right, guys, you love that. So now convince your neighbors. And so suddenly, everyone can take a branch of that and dip it into a pot of soil and cover it, put a rock on top of that, have it root. And then suddenly, everyone has a piece of that kiwi. And it's even if someone, your neighbor moves in and goes, I hate this, cuts it all. It's still alive because everyone's rooting it on each balcony. And so, <laughs> right. you're right. And then let's say right. you go away for two weeks. 
well, the soil dries up on your balcony, but that doesn't mean that that kills the plant. The plant's 40 feet tall, wrapped around your Manhattan skyscraper, giving you shade in the August heat and the mugginess. It provides this cooling effect, right? So, you know, like I would do something like that. Um, uh, you can totally grow things inside and have them go out the window. So, like, let's say you have a pumpkin or um, something crazier, like, um, oh, you could do something so cool. Like, you, you could do uh, the small, like, melons. Like, uh, you could do um, the Rich Sweetness 132 or the Tigger Melon. Tigger Melon, you know, the stripes, right? Right? Um, you could grow that and have it crawl out the window. They're so easy to train. You would just do, like, um, you would just do some, uh, I'm smelling burning. Hold on. Not us. <laughs> Not us. <laughs> the other house. Okay. Gosh. <laughs> Not my dinner burning. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a lot of things you can do. And I hope someone. I hope someone in Manhattan is listening to this about the kiwi tree because that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> that okay. would be a cool thing to see. <laughs> right, and then indoors you got all this shade, right? You got all this darkness potentially inside. Um, no windows, maybe even. So I would just. Do you smell that? Yeah. It's burning. Yeah, it's not. It's, well, anyway. Um, so you could do mushrooms very easily, and you have all this paper waste. Oyster mushrooms can, like, lots of mushrooms eat that. Um, you just shred it, you get it wet. They will Goldilocks wet, right? Can't be too wet, can't be too uh, dry. Um, and then you can inoculate it all. And let's say some of it is questionable paper and you don't like, like the, you, you know, you're worried about the toxins and stuff. You, you know, make, uh, rip it up and turn it back into soil. It gets trapped into uh, long chains of carbon. I guess that's what compost is. That's why it's so dark. So that's carbon, you know. Um, you know, you can grow um, trees in um, crude oil because it's all carbon, too. Uh, people have done this, actually, in Iran. They did this in the 90s. Um, so you take that compost, um, and then you can grow your food in it. So uh, most people would just eat the mushrooms, though. Um, <laughs> So, and then you could even even take your coffee grind and grow oyster mushrooms on it if you, if you drink coffee or, you know, you drink Gerson therapy or something like that. Um, so, I mean, there's a billion and one options. Urban permaculture is a huge growing field, especially because it requires um, a lot of creativity um, and because uh, a lot of the um, solutions uh, require participation with lots of groups of people. So you get like an apartment complex agreeing to do something, and then you get some real change happening. Um, and I just don't think that any mandate would ever work because you're asking people to eat it. You know what I mean? They're going to want to grow what they want to grow. They're going to want to love what they want to love. You can't mandate anything. And so uh, that's the other thing about permaculture is it decentralizes everything, which um, gardening is a great way for people to take control of their their food power and a way to declare their food sovereignty and be like, listen, I have control over what goes into my body. Despite what the FDA says, you know, that we have no choice over what goes into our body. I believe we do. So, yeah, I hope that people, like, start using more uh, urban permaculture because um, they've got all the resources. They've got all that waste that they can use as compost. They've got all that paper. Um... It's all concrete, so you're trapping all that water. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like New York City has tons of water. It also all flows out the sea. And actually, when it flows out, when it rains really hard, all the sewage, um, all the sewage overflows into the uh, Long Island Sound. That's why we could swim in it routinely. I'm um, growing up, so we have like plenty of resources. We just have to get wise and use them wisely. You know, what if we took all, all that water and filled up, you know, a few of those. Uh, a few of those uh, parking um, things all the way up and did fishing. We did aquaponics in the middle of the city. <laughs> yeah, sounds like lots of lots of possibilities. I was so you're trying to pass a lot of this on to uh, your students, right? Because you're a teacher and you're right. also writing a book on permaculture. Because you didn't find any resources out there 
Um, for kids. Kid and the thing is, right? there's stuff to help kids in gardens written for adults. I want something a sixth grader can take and go, this is cool. You need any help? No, no, no. I'm fine. I'm going to go do something. <laughs> and then they go away, and they find value in it, and they can do it for me. Um, growing up, like I read everything my like and like learned almost everything myself first because we'd go to bed when it was light out, and we had to be quiet. We were spanked, so there was a big library in the room with like all the way to like college level reading, um, and so I just read for like ever. I would stay up like really really late um, reading, and so I digested a lot, and like I feel like. Um, that's given me a lot of my ability to do what I do is because I feel like I can figure things out. And um, our school manuals are designed to be taught by experts to children. We take information, we put, you know, we educate them. And it's like, no, actually you can't force anyone to learn anything. You can create resentment and hatred and anger but you can't force someone to love something. You can't force someone to um, be passionate about something. So, um, anyway. Yeah, um, I absolutely agree. So how's uh, the book? Is it on its way? Is it done? Oh yeah. How's it going? Right. It, it, it's done. Um, we just are waiting for the art. Uh, we, we basically, I, I had um, like four awesome sketches we were going to add in and have like this awesome guy who's this world famous Illustrator Wayne Fleming, who did uh, the cover for Bill Mollison's Introduction to Permaculture, and um, we made so much money that so fast that I had to come up with something that I felt was make would make it worthwhile um, to keep going for the stretch goals, you know, on Kickstarter. And the thing is, it's like, okay, well, I can't like go and advertise unless I have a, like a stretch goal that's meaningful. It can't just be like profit for me because I wouldn't be able to say anything else. Like, support me. Me getting out of debt. You know what I mean? Like, So I was like, alright, well if we're going to hit 15,000, we're going to make this book better. And so I made a crazy promise and said at 15,000, we would um, put the workbooks in color. If you know anything about printing, the difference between black and white and color, quite pricey, like ridiculously pricey. Okay, and some of these books are going all the way to Australia, where the book may have cost me. Uh, they may be pledging forty-five dollars, but shipping alone is fifty-five dollars. Wow. So. so you so you the equation of $1,000 was me breaking even, right? So because I wanted to be fair, right? So I broke even at 15, and, like, my wife totally was like, ah, there's no margin for error, right? So I'm like, okay, well, the month's half over, you know? And so I started promoting because I could believe in it, right? And so I raised a lot more money, and we hit 27000 and I actually added more goals in and we added more art in because, again, I have a compulsion to speak the truth because I believe that's the only way to live and the only way to be honest to oneself and to have full power over what we, ha we have to offer ourselves. You know, I can only access what I have if I'm truly honest. So I can't advertise something that would just be purely selfish. It would come through, you know what I mean. Even I, I can't, you know what I mean. I can't lie. So um, I just had to improve it. And the and the coolest thing about it is it's going to be amazing. It's going to be like way better than anything I could possibly imagine. And it's going to be like more scientific. We've added like all this like technical stuff in because he's such a good artist and his in his comic style is like humor. Uh, you can see some of the, the art on my Facebook, facebook.com, uh, the permaculture student. It's some of the artwork is just got like this wonderful humor, and you can just like tell kids are gonna read it and be like engaged instantly by the style. 
And it's like, wow, this is where it's at. And actually, the next two volumes, no, you can't eat anymore. My, my dog's literally eating, um, he's eating sprouted um, potatoes and onions. I don't know why, but he's maybe just... Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> so when yeah, is it well, uh, due out? That's all sprouting, so I'm going to break it up and replant it and everything. I do a lot of that. And so, like, for instance, like, this is a very permy thing to do. You cut the bottom of this off and put it in a shallow dish with a little bit of water, and all these will open up and roots will come out, and then the top will regrow this. And then you can plant that, and then you have onions again. And so you could forever have onions and never buy seed. Or let it go to seed and then plant those. So, you know what I mean? Tons of options. Um, ooh, it's getting cold. How much time, uh, more time do we have? Well, we probably better wrap it up now. Yeah. Bit, so. We're going to hit an hour here, getting close pretty quick. But it's been uh, great, great talking with you. Um, where can where can people find you, uh, Matt, if they wanted to follow what you're doing on your property and and how your books come along? Well, on Twitter, I'm Permaculture One Two Three. Uh, on Facebook, the best place is the Permaculture Student. So just facebook.com backslash the Permaculture Student. Um, or you can go to my website, thepermaculturestudent.com. There is uh, lesson plans up there, but there are also, you know, recipes. So, like, you want to learn how to sheet mulch, there's uh, my lesson plan is like $5, and you get um, how to sheet mulch, how to make a worm juice compost bin, um, and then the third one is how to make a swale on contour. So... Those three lessons are in there, just five bucks. Um, it's got illustrations, it's got step-by-step -step directions, um, and it's an instant PDF download that you can have forever and do what you will. So there's that. That's where it can be found. Um, I'll be back on Kickstarter in probably four to five months doing the next, the next volume because the first volume is uh, it can be used by anyone. It can be used by adults or families or homeschoolers or public school or Montessori or you know anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's primarily for uh, middle schoolers because it's on a set in an academic reference language that's open to any level reader really that that can comprehend this. So and then um, I've got to do the high school versions, which were more advanced. I'm 60 pages into the rough draft for the uh, the next volume, the ninth, tenth grade volume, um, and that's going to have more things in it. That's going to have like gasification. That's going to have things like um, micro remediation, how to use mushrooms to uh, clean water or fix the soil contaminants, or like you know an experiment like taking cigarette butts and training them, uh, training mushrooms to eat them, stuff like that. You know. <laughs> Uh, actually, I, I, I want the first thing to do is we make a mushroom sculpture. So you inoculate a piece of wood and a mushroom put on it, and it's like a living sculpture they can bring home. So stuff like that, you know, fun stuff that uh, we can get into schools and have as uh, independent programs. I'm actually teaching uh, the first um, permaculture class with a curriculum uh, that's designed for high school um, this fall at Minarets High School, which is the high school I teach at, um, in the foothills over here. It's getting cold. All right, we better let you go. Well, thank you, and best of luck uh, with your book. And thank you so much Thanks. for uh, giving us the time this evening. It's great to talk to you. All right. Great to talk to you. And if you guys have any questions ever, just uh, tweet at me at permaculture123, and I'll answer on there, always. I'm a teacher, so I will always give information. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> Take care. Have a good one.